expeditions and French scientific expeditions would follow to destinations such as Senegal and Ecuador. A revolutionary idea. On January 11, 1667, five years before the mission to French Guiana, astronomer Adrien Ozout stood in the meeting room of the sumptuous Bibliothèque du Roi in Paris. Before a small assembly of men in long, thick wigs, he laid out a bold program of scientific research. Ozout's plan was wide-ranging and visionary. He recognized that certain astronomical questions, including the distances to the planets and the sun, would require taking observations simultaneously in two different locations, such as in Paris and a far-flung locale. Ozout argued for a voyage all the way to Madagascar, where the East India Company was expected to establish operations, and the proximity to the equator would allow astronomers to take key observations. As the men listened, the sounds and smells of a squalid congested city may have wafted through the windows. In the late 17th century, Paris was known for raucous church processions, drunken merrymaking, and open gun violence. At the strike of seven each morning, city officials marched down the wide boulevards, ringing large bells to wake residents, directing them to clean the filth that had accumulated in front of their homes or risk a fine. The bustling city was a hotbed of both intellectual activity and commerce, where a large affluent population mixed freely with members of a forward-thinking scientific community. Two years after Auzout's speech, in April 1669, Cassini arrived in Paris. He had been personally invited by King Louis XIV and would swiftly become one of the Academy's most illustrious figures. Cassini was 44 years old when he set off for Paris, a bachelor with a carriage full of astronomical instruments, says Bernardi. As the Academy continued to prepare for an astronomical expedition to the equator, the scientists shifted their focus from Madagascar to Cayenne. This French settlement was a shorter distance away, and the Academy had to act quickly to catch a noteworthy event. In the fall of 1672, Mars and Earth would be at their closest points to each other in 15 years. In the late 17th century, the French ace aid. About 350 years ago, French astronomer Jean Richet led a voyage to South America that would reveal the true immense scale of the solar system. On a drizzling day in May 1673, deep in the dense rainforest of French Guiana, a scientist died. Known to historians only by his first name, Maurice, he may have been cut down by disease or perhaps a fatal accident, but a full description of his death was never properly recorded. The only person with him was his partner, an astronomer named Jean Richer, who was stricken ill and fighting for his own life. Sent by the French Academy of Sciences at the behest of astronomer Giovanni Cassini, part of their mission was to take a measurement that would reveal the distance between Earth and the Sun, a value that was not yet known. As long as humankind has gazed up at the sky, there have been attempts to determine the distance to the Sun. Scientists in antiquity such as Eratosthenes and Ptolemy produced estimates that varied significantly, often greatly underestimating the true value. By the 1670s, aided by newly developed astronomical instruments, Cassini was determined to find the answer once and for all. Inhabiting the second floor of the Paris Observatory, he worked on the problem unrelentingly. He had no hobbies, says Gabriella Bernardi, author of Giovanni Domenico Cassini, a modern astronomer in the 17th century. From his diary emerges a man completely devoted to his profession. In many ways the late 17th century journey to French Guiana was routine, part of a series of scientific expeditions dispatched by Cassini. Richer and Maurice had voyaged to northeastern North America two years earlier to measure latitudes and the heights of the tides, and French scientific expeditions would follow to destinations such as Senegal and Ecuador. A revolutionary idea. On January 11, 1667, five years before the mission to French Guiana, astronomer Adrien Ozou stood in the meeting room of the sumptuous Bibliothèque du Roi in Paris. Before a small assembly of men in long, thick wigs, he laid out a bold program of scientific research. Right at the time the Academy is being conceived, they're already thinking about astronomical expeditions, says Nicholas Dew, a historian at McGill University. Azu was the planner of this, 
He had the vision of using colonial trade networks to send observers to points around the globe to conduct observations in astronomy. As the men listened, the sounds and smells of a squalid congested city may have wafted through the windows. In the late 17th century, Paris was known for raucous church processions, drunken merrymaking, and open gun violence. At the strike of seven each morning, city officials marched down the wide boulevards, ringing large bells to wake residents, directing them to clean the filth that had accumulated in front of their homes or risk a fine. The bustling city was a hotbed of both intellectual activity and commerce, where a large affluent population mixed freely with members of a forward-thinking scientific community. Two years after Ozut's speech, in April 1669, Cassini arrived in Paris. He had been personally invited by King Louis XIV and would swiftly become one of the Academy's most illustrious figures. Cassini was 44 years old when he set off for Paris, a bachelor with a carriage full of astronomical instruments, says Bernardi. Preparing for the journey Richer and Maurice spent several days and nights working alongside Cassini to prepare for the joint observations they'd have to make while thousands of miles away. The pair of apprentices knew they were embarking on a perilous journey. Traveling first to the French port of La Rochelle, Richet and Maurice spent three months methodically testing and calibrating their instruments, including an octant, a quadrant, several telescopes of various sizes, and a few pendulum clocks. They set sail for Cayenne on February 8, 1672 on a merchant vessel, possibly an empty slave ship on its way to Senegal. Gazing up from the ship's deck one evening during the passage, Richer made detailed observations of a comet with two bright tails streaking across the inky black sky. The pair arrived in Cayenne on April 22, 1672. Fert Aurum Industries, work brings wealth. Whoever coined Cayenne's official motto must have had a grim sense of humor. The tiny, desolate settlement could not have been an encouraging sight to Richer and Maurice. Visited by only two or three ships a year, the island of Cayenne was separated from the rest of Guyana by the narrow 11-mile Mahuri estuary on one side and the slender Cayenne River on the other. As they stepped off the boat, the pair may have realized that they had chosen the most unpleasant time of year to arrive. In the Amazon, late April is near the height of monsoon season, oppressively humid and thick with mosquitoes. The sheets of rain fell on them mercilessly, flooding the river yet providing no relief from the sweltering heat. At the center of the settlement stood Fort Seperu, a bleak, lonely structure rebuilt in stone from wood after the most recent attack by the indigenous population, signifying the French colonists' determination to stay. A short walk from the fort was the King's Store, a general store that served the settlement and often had little on the shelves. There was also a modest Jesuit church and mission house. A 1685 account, noted in Catherine Lozier's Supplying Cayenne under the Old Regime Archaeology and History of Commercial Networks, describes it as a dwelling occupied by four fathers and a brother, along with 82 enslaved African people, 32 men, 23 women, and 27 children, to work the Jesuits' crops and tend to their livestock. And then there were the Kalina, the indigenous people, also called the Galibi, had resided in the Cayenne region for over 2,000 years before Europeans arrived. As one settler, Paul Boyer, would write after a visit around 1654, all the Galibi could think about was how to be 